Welcome from the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin for our third day of the Martin Roth Symposium 2020. Little would be possible without partners. So thanks to the organizing partners, IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, in cooperation with Republika, kindly supported by Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin and funded by Germany's Federal Foreign Office. For the Martin Roth Symposium, we will a digital theme week from 7th to 11th September 2020. The Martin Roth Symposium aims to bring together thought leaders from the cultural, the academic, the artistic and the political sectors to share their ideas and future scenarios. And today, today we are discussing about museum and entertainment, as the discourses of museums today cannot be without considerations about participation and involvement of the audience. So, how can the social space of the institution and the exhibition spaces of the museums be filled with life? Is it more about enjoyment, what museums must offer to the public? Or are we afraid to put popular entertainment on museums' programs? Should we just leave it to the entertainment industry? These are some of our questions for today. Let's unpack these ideas and alternatives to these and other questions. And I'm sure it will challenge our traditional views of reality, the role of institutions versus open spaces, and finally the debate how to merge art, science and entertainment. We start again with sprints. And these are 10-minute inputs where speakers present their thoughts on our today's topic, museums and entertainment. Robin Reardon is with us. She's the portfolio executive producer at Walt Disney Imagineering. Also, Tim Reeve, deputy director and chief operating officer of the Victoria and Albert Museum. With us today is also Marie-Cécile Sinzu, president of the foundation Sinzu in Benin, West Africa. And P. Lee, senior curator of M Plus Hong Kong and Raphael Moku Schiller, creative director and co-founder of Noise Spaces. Following each speaker, we will have a deep dive and here you, the participants, can meet many of our speakers for Q&As after their sessions. As we are all in the virtual space, it'll be a 15 minute live online exchange in a digital discussion room. And in case you need further information, don't hesitate. Click on the button, the buy sign, take part on the website campus.republica.com. Before opening for questions or comments by you, some first responders present their thoughts on the spirit. It's a quick kickoff for the following lively discussion. And our first responder of today is Manu Sher Shamsrizi, co-founder of Game Lab Berlin at the Hermann von Helmholtz Zentrum für Kulturtechnik at the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. And at the end of our third symposium day, we close with the Future Forward session, a conversation between a forward-thinking professional and a student responder. So, we will look into today's topic from their perspectives and from their backgrounds. I'm ready. Are you? Let's get started and listen to the sprints together. Good afternoon from New York. My name is Robin Reardon, and I'm the executive portfolio producer at Walt Disney Imagineering. My job is to lead the creative development team in the creation of experiences and attractions. Walt Disney Imagineering is the creative engine that designs and builds all Disney theme parks, resorts, attractions, and cruise ships worldwide. I'm excited to join today in the discussion on museums and entertainment. In 2007, the ICOM defined museums as a nonprofit permanent institution in the service of society and its development, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment. That's a lot of words. While I know this definition is ever evolving, it's a good place to start to identify the areas of intersection between entertainment and museums. Two words in that previous definition will be the focus of what I wanna talk about today, communicate and enjoyment. Because if you succeed in those two things, education and perhaps action will follow. Communicating ideas and concepts, real or fantastic, is what Disney does. We create places designed to promote and encourage shared experiences through innovative storytelling and immersive placemaking. We like to say we create memories. Sometimes our goal is to make fantasy real. And sometimes, as at Epcot Center, the goal is to make reality fantastic. The initial concept for Epcot was first communicated in 1966. It was an experimental prototypical community of tomorrow, a living working city where people would live and work 
with the joint focus of solving the issues of cities. Walt Disney felt strongly that the solution of the world's problems were not locked in a single location, branch of government, sector of industry, but rather in all of those places in the minds and creativity of individuals. What was needed was a place, an ignition, a shared experience that would spark those ideas and motivate society to action. To do that, those ideas needed to be communicated to a world in a way that was compelling and relevant. The notion of the working city evolved into more of a permanent world expo. And in 1982, Epcot opened as the second major theme park at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. While Epcot itself is not a working city, many of the progressive ideas and, and technology strategies were incorporated in the Walt Disney World Resort, including solar power, innovative waste management systems, electric vehicles, and a monorail transportation system. But the basis of Epcot remained to tell real world stories that inform, entertain, and inspire. A place that, according to Walt, would always be in a state of becoming. At Epcot, we believe the spirit of optimism and hope inspires the world. That anything is possible through human ingenuity and imagination, and that life is better when we engage with and celebrate each other in the world. The industry reported that Epcot saw over 12 million visitors in 2019. 12 million international visitors introduced to the stories at Epcot. How well we did our jobs as designers, as cast members, as storytellers, determined the level of engagement, the intensity of memory of those 12 million visitors. A story well told can be the difference between memory and obscurity, between engagement and disinterest, between passivity and action. In a theme park, a story is told through words, characters, music, placemaking. It may be enhanced with visual effects and the interaction of the cast members. Cast members is a term that Disney uses for all of our frontline employees who interact with guests and, and help tell that story. Whether the story is about history, science, the future, or a particular Norwegian inspired ice princess, the intended result is a shared experience, a memory, a story that then gets retold. Every story, every planned guest experience at Imagineering starts with the clear design principle. These principles become the basis of design decisions. They unite the team, they unite the process, they become the center of every story. Epcot was conceived on Walt's sense of optimism for the future, a belief in the possibilities of human creativity and innovation. That becomes the basis of our design principles. Through the years, as we've added new experiences or adapted existing ones, those principles have been refined, restated, and updated to ensure that the future team stay true to the authentic and original vision while still embracing and adapting to new audiences, new technologies, and new stories of the future. Think of the design principles as a checklist. Is the story that we're telling about real worlds made fantastic? Does it connect the audience? Can they see themselves in the story? Does it spark curiosity, exploration, and discovery? Does it connect as humans to a shared story? Those design principles are different for our other parks. At the Magic Kingdom, Walt Disney World's first theme park, Fantasy Reigns. This is the home of princesses and pirates and talking animals and space adventures. In the Magic Kingdom, we're encouraging the suspension of disbelief. We encourage guests to forget reality and believe for a minute that they can fly, that they're a pirate, that they can visit a faraway planet. At Epcot, we use the same storytelling tools, but we strive to not to suspend disbelief, but to inspire engagement, discovery, and imagination. We inspire guests to be an astronaut, to be an inventor, not to be the object of someone else's story, but the creator of their own. If you're swept up in the thrill of how a story is told, the story itself becomes more engaging, more memorable. So as an example, shortly after Epcot opened in 1986, the Living Seas Pavilion opened. It was at the time, the world's largest indoor saltwater aquarium, which was pretty cool. But as a tourist, looking at the diversity of sea life in a really big fish tank is cool. But what if, instead of just viewing 
I'm an oceanographic researcher at the bottom of the ocean studying, studying marine life. So we invented the hydrolator, which was a simulated elevator experience that took guests to the bottom of the ocean. And in so doing, we transformed passive observers into active explorers. And then we added a scuba diver that swam through, which added even more reality to what you were viewing, more thrilling than any fantasy ocean adventure. Reality made fantastic, inspiring young visitors to explore. A simple change of POV can create lasting impressions, connection, and a deeper engagement. We as designers have to constantly police ourselves to see our world and our work through the guest point of view. Whether it is a new experience, a new exhibit, or the revision or updating of an existing exhibition, we have to be aware of subtle detractors the, that unintentionally exclude our guests from, and, and keep them from engaging in the story. The choice of a narrator, the use of technology that might be superfluous to the story, languages, language or images that might exclude or at some level communicate, this isn't for me, this doesn't include you. All of that can limit engagement and therefore the number of voices, the number of people that will participate in that discussion, in that experience. To engage an audience, we must be clear on who the audience is. We must write a story in words that resonate. We must use tools and technology that is appropriate to that content. And we must consistently revisit those choices as the audience, the context, and the story itself evolves. Whether we were asking our audience to experience a planet in a galaxy far, far away, or the artifacts of a civilization from centuries ago, we must invite them in, ignite their curiosity, spark their imagination, tell them a compelling story. We must at some level entertain. So thank you very much, and I really look forward to our deep dive discussion. Hello everyone, and let me start by saying how pleased and indeed relieved I am to be able to join you for the second Martin Roth Symposium. And may I say a, a thank you in particular to the organizing committee for inviting me to participate. I'm also delighted to be joining you from my office at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, reopened to the public a couple of weeks ago after 138 days of closure the longest period of closure since the Second World War. A glimmer of light at the end of a very long and dark tunnel, an experience uh, I know shared by colleagues across the world. And giving us the opportunity for the first time in several months, both to reflect and to imagine and shape a new future in a social, political and ec economic context that has of course changed beyond all recognition. The context for any discussion about the role of museums in the middle of the 21st century, the role of any public institution come to that, has also been transformed. Discussions and debates that were in the tentative early stages before lockdown are now being accelerated. Calls for change to institutional strategy, values and culture have become more impassioned. And I welcome that new sense of urgency and impatience, whilst at the same time, of course, wishing desperately that the events that have led to this new sense of urgency and ambition had not taken place. Only last year, ICOM, the International Forum for Museums, made a protracted and ultimately unsuccessful attempt to design a new definition for museums, which suggested that once again, there is a perceived contradiction between museums as places of scholarship and debate, for learning, for the safeguarding and conserving of humankind's creative and cultural legacy, and their responsibility to connect more powerfully with contemporary society, with its many and complex challenges, to innovate and find new modes of engagement. Now it is clear that museums must de develop an ambitious and sustainable response to the challenges thrown down by the Black Lives Matter movement, following the gratuitous and horrific murder of George Floyd in Minnesota, in a world where nearly one million people have lost their lives to coronavirus, 
and with the economic impact and uncertainty that now lies ahead for so many across the world in the months and years to come. And if that were not enough, those of us who call the UK home have the added complexity and confusion of Brexit to look forward to. So in this new reality, what is the future for museums as places of entertainment, which can lift our spirits, make us smile and indulge in some escapism, to have some fun, at the same time as embracing the complex challenges and opportunities from the last few months. It can be daunting, and I remind myself constantly of the British historian David Olisoga's recent quote, there is a tendency within Britain to see history as a place you go for recreation, to feel good about yourself, and that this cannot in any longer prevent the telling of history, warts and all, honest and transparent. Museums have some challenges to respond to for sure, around equality and diversity of opportunity in their ranks and at board level, around decolonization and restitution, and around the very surviving survival of their operating model and financial sustainability. But they also have a role to play in shaping and inspiring a future of possibility and opportunity. A museum at the top of its game, even now in 2020, should provide experiences which are just that, experiences which are joyful, fun, uplifting, optimistic, emotional, and responsive to the world as it changes around us. We are not businesses, but we should be business-like. We are not part of the entertainment industry, but it is okay, I think, to say that we are in the happiness business, looking to entertain as well as to inform, to be places for serious debate about the future of our society, but places for escapism, escapism, for leisure, for recharging. Many cultural organisations in the UK and elsewhere are trying to navigate a path through what at first glance appear to be competing priorities and demands. As I speak, the heated public debate in UK cultural circles, primarily taking place through Twitter, surrounds a leaked draft 10-year plan developed by the National Trust, a charity as custodians of 300 country houses and estates and huge swathes of countryside, which tries to make sense of this new reality reducing costs to reflect depressed visitor demand, and at the same time, looking to equalize their visitor experience for a more diverse audience, and using their country house inheritance in particular to create a more balanced narrative, not least where it involves the lives of their original inhabitants. The criticism of what at first glance seems to be perfectly balanced and responsible discussion documents, and certainly at least well-intended, has been somewhat predictable, with its opponents deploying in my view, some well-worn and tired cliches. This quote is fairly typical from a well-known cultural commentator and designer whose blushes I will spare. Quote, the country house is Britain's greatest contribution to the history of art. It is one of our great treasures. The National Trust has sworn to protect the country house and now it is trying to neglect it. They, the National Trust, are trying to turn themselves from an antiquarian body into a group which is in the business of entertainment. In the entertainment industry, all that counts is getting visitor numbers up, so that's what they do. They'll put in go-kart tracks and bouncy castles given half the chance. It's so cretinous. This is the old Disneyfication line of attack that implies there is no space between populist entertainments, theme parks, football, the cinema, and high art and scholarship. No room for programming, and experiences that entertain as well as educate, that inspire as well as inform. For critics of moves away from the status quo, it has to be one or the other. And if you are doing both, you are either dumbing down or you are super, super serving the cognoscenti, the educated elite, the culturally empowered. This thinking cannot be allowed to re-emerge, certainly not at institutions like the VNA, with its audience reach and its physical resources. Four million visitors a year, 100,000 members, two and a half million objects, and seven miles of public galleries. We have the space and experience to serve and reflect different interests, perspectives, preferences, and modes of consumption. In what is, after all, for most people, their leisure time, without spreading ourselves too thinly and compromising our commitment to excellence. Museums operate as part of the experience economy and have a serious track rec record in delivering programming which is memorable, emotional, and crucially, Instagrammable and TikTokable. 
Audience feedback and research clearly show that museums need not be pressured into choosing between artificial conflicts as they adjust to the demands and challenges of the moment. Very few of the nearly one and a half million people who visited the VMA to see exhibitions on Christian Dior, David Bowie, or Alexander McQueen, or who attended the seminal takeover of the VMA by Galden, an organization established to support women of color in their creativity, would say that they were not entertained as well as informed and educated. These are performances and events, after all, or a happening, as one Vista memory described the Savage Beauty exhibition. Nor is there any evidence to suggest that those who visited other parts of the museum felt that we had diluted the museum's commitment to scholarship and education in the breadth and depth of our programme. Our museum, and many others like it, was created from the Great Exhibition, like the world's fairs that followed, using design, scale, wonder and ambition to entertain the population. Six million people, a third of the UK's population at the time, came to see came to see the exhibition, as well as engaging and inspiring them through art and design excellence from across the world. The building that became the VNA, from the world's first refreshment rooms designed by William Morris, through to the soaring drama of the cast courts, the elegance and light of the medieval and Renaissance galleries, and from the majesty of Aston Webb's Cromwell Road entrance and facades, to Amanda Levitt's icy ceramic courtyard on Exhibition Road. This is an institution that has been designed to provide a canvas and a stage for performance, for entertainment and inspiration. Martin Ross, final exhibition as director of the VNA, achieved this delicate but powerful balance and overlap between excellence and entertainment. An exhibition on revolution, a story of 1960s rebellion and the shifting of social tectonic plates told through art, design, fashion and performance literally next door to an exquisite and forensically researched exhibition on med medieval embroidery, Opus Anglicanum, a perfect example of an institution in tune with its audience, connected with issues and agendas in the real world, but rooted in peerless and painstaking research, conservation and display of objects from across the world that tell a story of human creativity and skill at its apogee. Responding to Black Lives Matter, coronavirus and Brexit is a serious business, a generational challenge that must be met, but entertainment, a shared visceral and emotional experience, joyfulness and optimism are more important than ever. Thank you for listening. So welcome dear participants. It's beautiful to have you with us on the third day of the Martin Roth Symposium about museums and entertainment for this deep dive with Robin Reardon, portfolio executive producer, Walt Disney Imagineering, whose sprint you just saw, and Manusher Shamsrisi, co-founder of GameLab Berlin at the Hermann von Helmholtz Zentrum für Kulturtechnik at the Humboldt University of Berlin, who will be our first responder for the whole day. My name is Fabian. I will guide you through the deep dive today. And it's a pleasure to have the two of you with us. And also it's a pleasure that you take the time to answer the audience questions. So thank you both. And it's great to be for, here. Yeah. for you as participants, uh, this is the time to ask your questions. So let me explain how to participate in the deep dive sessions. If you have a question, there are three ways to include them in the, this discussion. The first one is via direct audio in this webinar. So please click on the raise your hand icon, which you can find in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. As soon as it is your turn, I will call you by name and enable your audio. Please unmute yourself so you can ask your question. As soon as you have asked it, we will turn off your audio again. Your video will never be used. So, but if you prefer, you can also ask your question in writing in the chat of this webinar, or you use our online form at campus.re-publica.com, campus.re-publica.com. If you're following from a website or through YouTube, we can include those questions as well. So if you have questions already, feel free to send them already and use the tools. So we have little time and I would like to ask Manu Sher for a quick reaction 
Robin Sprint. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you, Robin, for, for that fantastic uh, input. And I uh, just want to uh, second what you all, uh, the audience just heard. This uh, is supposed to be very interactive, which also means uh, the first responder is supposed to uh, be short in what he does in his response uh, and uh, as provocative as possible so that we can enter uh, into a dialogue and discussion. So please uh, bear with me as I'm not going to um, repeat all the many things and dimensions in Robin's input that I uh, wholeheartedly agree with, uh, which has been uh, a lot just to uh, mention one, uh, the distinction between uh, engagement and activity uh, to which it leads on the one side and uh, disinterest and, and, and passivity uh, that resonated a lot with me. Um, if you look at uh, in museums, uh, I believe that this distinction is, the, um, is a very clear uh, and very fundamental learning from the entertainment world, which of course is uh, in, in, in all of its uh, um, uh, varieties, uh, uh, even being be it theaters, be it uh, cinemas, be it books, be it uh, games, uh, very good in um, really uh, making um, uh, or conceptualizing uh, their approaches built on that understanding of when is something uh, 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 leading into activity and when it's something leading into passivity. And, and as I see it, um, uh, and I'm with Robin on that, um, disinterest uh, is, is of no value uh, in, in no scenario uh, I can think of. So that is something uh, to avoid. And, and there's a um, learning uh, for uh, the museum uh, world um, uh, there that, uh, in, uh, that they can really make themselves useful uh, from the entertainment world. Uh, having said that, um, I believe in um, the end, um, and that's the provocative part to say so, um, when Robin was sharing with us uh, Disney's uh, idea of uh, uh, creating memories, um, that, that of course um, can have, uh, or, or there is a critical perspective needed that the museum world can bring into that because every time memories are created um, uh, and, and every time reality in distinction to fantasy does these two fields uh, uh, impact each other, uh, the question is legitimate, whose memories, uh, whose reality, whose stories are, are told by whom? And Robin mentioned partly uh, aspects of diversity, but I think um, uh, in the end, uh, the question whose stories uh, should be told uh, and uh, whose reality really uh, should be um, shown in an engage engagement uh, positive uh, way. That is something that I personally would not see in um, the uh, sphere of the entertainment industry alone. To give you an example, I'm very sorry to Robin, but I could not spare uh, you with this. Um, the risk of not having the research and scholarly perspective of the world of museums uh, uh, when it comes to the question what reality is, 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 um, is told to the world by, by whom, no matter the way it is told. Um, I have a very concrete example of why I think there's a risk. And uh, Robin talked to us about um, uh, pirates, uh, which I personally am a huge fan of. And... Uh, uh, I have to show it this way so that everybody in the audience can, can uh, see uh, and get my point. Uh, there has been an attempt by Disney to tell the reality of pirates, uh, which resonated a lot uh, with the internet. Um, that's from uh, a TV series uh, by Disney. And uh, one of the um, dimensions of the pirate's reality that's been told here, just as an example, is that a good pirate uh, never takes another person's property. And of course, in the uh, cultural technique of memes, which is such a powerful tool of storytelling uh, in, in the age of uh, digital connection, somebody put down uh, a picture from, I'm not quoting, but another uh, 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 very uh, successful entertainment um, uh, 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 genre, uh, a movie, uh, uh, pointing out that uh, 
uh, you are without uh, doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. So uh, that's just an example because Robin told us about pirates and I totally agree uh, uh, that, that, that kids should learn about pirates. But if the reality this details as an entertainment industry without having scholarly uh, uh, backup by museums is the reality of pirates that should not uh, and never took another person's property uh, we run into uh, uh, difficulties of uh, alternate realities to, to say so and that we should avoid and I believe we can easily avoid by collaboration between these two worlds of entertainment and museums. Um, okay. There we go. Thank you very much for your statement already. We already have the first questions coming in through our tools and um, I would like to ask the first question by Ariane who asks, what exactly do you mean with the audience's engagement? Like how does the storytelling lead to action and which actions would be the goal according to Disney's vision? That's gonna depend on, on the, the actual exhibit so, or the actual experience. So to the, to the point that the, the, the first responder was just making about um, comparing scholarly reports on, on pirates, for example, agree with you, but that was the distinction between the Magic Kingdom and, and in this case, Epcot, where we tell real world stories. So in fantasy, where we are suspending disbelief, like every fantasy, you know, we don't believe that, that there are witches who can, you know, have poison apples and, and princesses that live up in towers. That, that's not real. There's no amount of, of um, meeting with with museum scholars that would make any of that real. So at some point we have to be, we have an op obligation to be very clear on when we're in the range of fantasy and when we're talking about real world things. In terms of audience engagement, um, at, at, at the lowest bar, what I'm referring to is if you draw somebody into the story and if you make that story memorable, then you will remember that experience. So if the first time that you saw a, a moon rock or the first time you saw an artifact from centuries before was at a museum and the way that that was presented and the way that, that you will remember when you saw that. And that is, that is where the, the goal of, I think, museum exhibits and entertainment are similar. You want to have that moment where the person, where the guest that came into the museum so engaged and so was moved by that content that they remember it, that they absorb it, that they, that they move to action. So there was actually, there's a museum, I, I wrote notes here, there's a museum in Ireland called the Cool Planet Experience. It just won this year the Themed Entertainment Association Award for Museums. And it was a, um, it was an old estate in Ireland that they wanted to, to convert to be more energy efficient. And in so doing, they created a guest experience. I haven't been there and was just listening to the case study the other day. A guest experience that drove guests in, you know, that, that drew guests in by, by asking them some questions at the beginning about what their carbon footprint was. And then through the exhibit and through different, um, through different experiences, they saw what the impact of their choices were and how they might have, um, they might have the potential to make further impact. So that particular exhibit, which was real content, which was real data, but was portrayed in using all the latest technology from both you know, tracking with, with IFR wristbands um, to engaging and providing content and, and real-time feedback and, and then having programs that you could immediately participate in or sign up for, whether it was you know, a camp on, on um, environmental issues, et cetera. So it was, it was that proximity of having the emotional engagement and then the opportunity to turn that into action. There's I want to agree question. with Robin on that. Uh, Can I just, just I would like to like, give the audience the, the chance to, to ask their questions. So, sorry to interrupt you this uh, so roughly, but we have to, I would like to include those questions as well, because I think there's one question by Harald, which is really also very much fitting to what you just said. 
Uh, also, where do you see the limits to the freedom in exploring or observing for those active observers you intend to create? So how do you make these limits transparent to the visitor? I'm not sure I understand. Can you say the question again? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah. So where do you see the limits also in participating and in actively participating or for the active observer that you int intend to create? So how do you make these limits transparent to the visitor? Well, in the theme park world, it's very specific because there are um, there are the physical requirements in a space in terms of what you can physically do, whether it's what you can touch, how close you can get. Um, so in in the sort of real world um, physical engagement that's communicated through the placemaking and the physical design of the exhibit, if if the question is more theoretical. Um, in terms of, of setting those expectations. I think that goes into the narrative that I'm not sure if, if there's no limit to what your participation can be. If, if what you're really, you know, if it's something so broad as you're trying to inspire people to be moved by art or moved by history, there really isn't a limit into what that participation or, or how that participation might be manifest in the day-to-day -day life? Do they, do they start seeking out more experiences? Do they read more? It's, it's happening in Black Lives Matter and in some of the, the social um, awakening that's happening is people I think are, are moved by what's happening in a way that, you know, historically it's, it sort of comes in waves, but we're at a moment now where I think there's a larger part of the population who is feeling things at a visceral level and is looking for ways to, to understand that more. And, and I think that the museum world has, has a role in explaining both the historical context that, that gives that dimension, um, as, well as, providing, as, as well as providing historically, at least, boundaries of successful and impactful participation. I'm not I sure think the, 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 the one of the most interesting dimensions uh, of, of Robin's introductory uh, uh, talk, but, uh, but also uh, what you just uh, said uh, in regard to the question, um, to both questions actually, is that aspect of experience uh, and, and something museums can learn from the entertainment world, uh, I would argue, is to make that experience not exclusively bounded to the physical reality. I, I can buy a ticket um, for a visit to a cinema or a music festival or whatsoever, and my experience starts uh, before. I was uh, going to point out uh, uh, in regard to your first uh, answer, uh, uh, Robin, I, I was at a um, music and uh, art and science festival in the Principality of Liechtenstein, which might not be a leader in the entertainment industry, but this one was fascinating because they asked us uh, including our speakers uh, for our date of birth. And when we arrived, then the, the um, little name tag that you usually get uh, had the amount of CO2 in our hometown uh, on our day uh, of birth, as well as the numbers of cars uh, in our hometown city. It all was designed the same way, but it was very personalized. And, and that's the two things, ex uh, making the experience um, uh, uh, non-correlating necessarily to the physical visit of a building of a museum, um, as well as uh, well, by sharing it on social media and so on and continue the dialogue, as well as personalizing it in a way that has not been possible uh, uh, so far without the digital tools. Entertainment is very good in that. And, and by doing these two things, personalizing and, and making the experience uh, a broader a continuum that is uh, uh, where the physical visit is only one part of before and after, uh, just as you said, I think that are two very valuable learnings from, from entertainment and Disney in particular, I guess, uh, for the world of museums uh, in regards to the questions we heard. Yeah. Unfortunately, we already have to come to an end of this very interesting conversation. It's really a, a short amount of time that we have. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't include all the questions. I'm sure we will get the chance at a later time and to ask your questions. Thank you very much, Robin, for your time and for answering the questions. Manusha will stay with us for the next deep dive with Tim Reeve, whose sprint you already heard, and which will begin in just about one minute. So thank you again, Robin. 
and Thank you. enjoy the rest of the program, I hope. Thank you. So welcome back, dear participants, to the second deep dive for today. We are very happy to welcome Tim Reeve with us, Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer of Victoria and Albert Museum. And still with us is Manusher Shamslisi, co-founder of GameLab Berlin at the Hermann von Helmholtz Zentrum für Kulturtechnik at the Humboldt University of Berlin. We are very happy to have you with us. Uh, just to remind you, there are three ways to include your questions, so the audience questions, that it's your chance to ask your question. So there are three ways how we can actually include them. You can participate via direct audio in this webinar by clicking the raise your hand icon. You can also ask the question in writing in the chat of this webinar, or you use our online form at campus.re-publica.com. If you are following from our website or YouTube, there is also the chance to include those questions at campus.re-publica.com. So let's dive in, and I would say, Manu Sher, you have the floor. Thank you. And once again, I'm trying to be short and uh, uh, provocative. Uh, uh, as uh, we have been asked to uh, start the discussion this way, um, but I, I will fail in doing so because I was uh, highly moved, uh, but uh, by what uh, Tim shared with us uh, uh, to say so. For example, the uh, connection between the role of the museum in the future as a, a part of the transformation of public institutions in general, I uh, tend to believe that that is an overseen uh, aspect, uh, that the uh, transformations in, in many, many ways, moral obligations, uh, transparency, accountability, uh, inclusiveness uh, that, that now the museums face, that's the same other institutions, uh, uh, not only, but mostly from the public sphere uh, phase, which which means that there might be uh, unheard uh, uh, neighborhoods and uh, potential collaborations uh, with part of the public administration still seen by many museums to say so uh, as as an enemy maybe because uh, that's where the money and the grants come from. But they really might, uh, in the way Tim described it, uh, uh, be partners. Um, really, I also um, uh, have been. Uh, moved by the idea of museums being in the happiness business. Uh, having an original background in political philosophy, uh, my, my first thought was, is he talking about happiness or is he talking about the business of joy? Um, I'm looking forward to learn more by, by Tim on this because, of course, there is a difference. And in the end, he talked about uh, joy as a dimension of uh, the experience in the museum as well. But generally, um, to, to maybe... Um, uh, point that out, I uh, was reminded of a discussion we have in the world of, of the cultural techniques of video games uh, for many, many years now, where there's a differentiation between serious gaming, um, a very uh, a European approach. I built an experience that has, uh, from the very beginning in its DNA, the aim of serving something beyond uh, uh, happiness and, and fun, and the much more successful approach that is discussed as gaming for impact, uh, which is a broader approach, accepting the fact that something might lead to happiness in the first place, and you still are able to build on, uh, uh, build around that happiness, uh, a real life serious uh, impact, uh, to say so. I also um, very much agree with uh, what Tim said, uh, uh, and I'm trying to quote, uh, that uh, uh, the critics uh, of uh, the distinction entertainment versus uh, edu uh, education uh, that are saying if you are uh, doing both, uh, you are serving the educated uh, elite only. Um, that is a very well-known critic of criticism because I believe the opposite is true, just as we heard. Uh, why should uh, a more uh, uh, experience-driven approach not uh, enable um, uh, people who might not be part of the uh, educated uh, culture elite to come. It might be the opposite. I would argue uh, it's the opposite. And um, uh, final point, uh, uh, so you see it's not very provocative uh, uh, in this case, I'm afraid. Um, 
the idea that uh, museums uh, should uh, connect with issues and uh, agendas of the real world um, and uh, do so by building up on research and, and scholarly work as well, uh, while still serving uh, in the happiness business. Um, I agree with that as well. Uh, and I look forward to uh, visit uh, uh, Victoria and Albert next time to uh, 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 learn how that uh, works in the practical uh, 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 implementation. Well, so there's a lot of agreement, obviously. I'm so sorry. Maybe, yeah, that's no problem at all. We already have a first question coming in by Giovanna, uh, who asks, Tim, how do you see the future of so the so-called blockbuster shows in the post-COVID world? Can they coexist with social distancing and time slots? How could you make up for that shortfall in funding at the V&A, for instance? What a great question. Um, and a question that we have asked ourselves many, many times over the last few months. Um, I mean, we, I don't like the term blockbuster. I mean, it, it, I, I think even that term sort of implies some sense that it's not sort of substantial and it's not, it's not a kind of a, a serious kind of exhibition, but there's no doubt that we, we've been very successful in part because we have been able to hit this sort of sweet spot uh, between uh, scholarship and, and entertainment with some of the exhibitions I referred to earlier. And that, that, that kind of model, if you like, that business model does require really substantial audiences of 300,000 to 500,000 visitors coming through through an exhibition and right now it is very difficult to imagine how that will ever be possible again. Um, so we, you know, we will, we will have to adapt. I think it will come back, but it will take years rather than months to come back. And, you know, we're, we're looking at a number of ways that we can, we can do things differently to capture our audience for, you know, for example, as we've done with our kimono exhibition during lockdown, having, um, having a, you know, a, a much better uh, digital version of that, exhibition obviously kind of free to access during lockdown but maybe in due course as our as our um, post-covid landscape looks clearer w working on um on on virtual exhibitions that that we feel you could also charge for in the way that you could charge for um uh, exhibitions here but the, the really important thing for the vna is is to see an exhibition as part of the overall program of the vna that somehow for you know, for most people, for lots of people, their access point to the VNA might be through an exhibition, or it might be through a first date with somebody who goes on to be their life partner, or it might be because they're meeting somebody for a business lunch in our members room. But it's just that the, the, the coming into the building, the act of coming into the building at whatever touch point might then start a journey, which leads to deeper and deeper engagement with the breadth of our collection and the depth of our kind of research. So that's a really, you know, big question for us to, to look at. The only thing I, I, I just wanted to kind of use as a prop, just in case I run out of time, is this. This is a trophy that we, we won, that we, we're kind of rather proud of at the VNA. This was the Alexander McQueen exhibition, and it was the award for outstanding achievement in presented by, as presented by the Themed Entertainment Association in Los Angeles. The exhibition judged to represent the highest standards of excellence and achievement associated with the arts and sciences of themed entertainment. So we can, museums can hit this sweet spot, can achieve this kind of balance. The question about how we continue to do that in the future, I think, is open one at this, at this point. Well, Manisha, maybe you can uh, share your opinion on how games can actually help with that. Is there a way to make bring games to the museum and sure. for sure well, that's a that's a long story in itself uh, uh, but uh, uh, i believe it goes back to our discussion uh, with robin uh, uh, a few minutes ago um it is uh, uh, also um, in in line with what tim said um many aspects of um gaming as a cultural technique can by definition because it's digital it's um, uh, 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 utopian to say so. It's not founded by, by physical reality. Can help to make the experience um, uh, uh, not just not starting with uh, entrance to the building uh, and, and ending with leaving the building, but it can start 
uh, to say so with an augmented reality uh, preview, once you got the ticket uh, at home, it can continue uh, something uh, the game lab is working on with many museums, including the Humboldt Forum, is a, is a gamified dialogue with objects. So you can talk to pieces of art. Uh, so many of the cultural techniques of gaming can, can help in expanding experience. It's less the technology, I would argue. It's more the understanding of, 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 of interaction uh, that Tim also uh, mentioned. Uh, to make it concrete, uh, I'm now not only looking forward to, to visit VNA at some point, uh, but maybe in the members room, uh, we can make sure it's not only uh, elder British gentlemen uh, uh, meeting for lunch, but maybe a short uh, a but nice esport tournament uh, would be uh, appropriate to uh, yeah. introduce a new audience. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we did do um, I mean, a, a brilliant exhibition on video games I know. and video game culture and uh, video games as a cultural phenomenon, but also as a, an extraordinary, extraordinary business uh, and means of engage, engaging with, with, with kind of Gen Z. I mean, it was, it was a, a great exhibition to, to do. It was incredibly successful and is on tour around the world. And I think for most people, their most memorable learning experiences from their formal education are, are through fun or through play. You know, everyone remembers the teacher that managed to bring a dry subject to life through, um, through, through a different mode of transmi transmission, a, a, a different form of kind of teaching. So I think, I think you're kind of right. And with all of these things, it is about achieving a, a balance that one doesn't want to go down a, a, a particular, a particularly kind of narrow um, path in terms of media, that different subjects for a different audience at a different place and at a different time require different media and different modes of modes of engagement. And as I said in my presentation, you know, we are lucky enough to be a big enough museum in, in terms of space and collections, not to be all things to all people, but to really explore lots of different, lots of different ways of doing things. And as, as you will have heard from Gus Casely Hayford, our, our, our new director of VNA East, with that particular institution to, 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 to build a new institution right in the heart of a community for whom the VNA is is it, it is not part of their lives. It's not a relevant institution, even though we are a public institution and a civic institution, there is a part of London that, that really hasn't had the opportunity to engage with us at all. So the so building an institution in in their backyard uh, as, as a, a much more direct means of engagement and to to build an institution that reflects their hopes and their their dreams it, it is also you know, a hugely important part of what we're trying to do in the future. I don't see any further questions by the audience at the moment. So I would like to bring this deep dive to an end. Thank you very much for taking your time and for bringing in your input. Thank you very much for taking the time, especially to Tim, who is leaving us now and uh, who's going to enjoy the rest of the program, I hope. Um, Thank you to Manusher, who will still be with us for the next deep dive at 6.30 with Marie-Cécile Sinsou, who will begin just after a short break. So I hope you have fun with the Mars program and see you in the next deep dive. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here um, today to speak about uh, museum and entertainment. Um, I've been creating a foundation, a private foundation uh, for contemporary art uh, in Western Africa, in Benin, in 2005. Um, why would I do such a thing? Um, quite easily, because uh, I was teaching uh, in a class at that time uh, with 40 children uh, wanted to know about art history. And so I started speaking about art history and very quickly I realized I was speaking about occidental uh, art history and that it was time to come to, to African uh, history and to contemporary art uh, and what was happening today in our country and on our continent. Very quickly I realized there was absolutely no way to show them 
uh, actual creation. There was no space. Uh, there were no space, um, either in Benin or in Togo or in Senegal. I couldn't find a, a place uh, where I could show them creation. So I tried to look where I could uh, bring them and uh, to what kind of space I could bring them. And very quickly, I realized the most important exhibition uh, with Beninese artists about African contemporary art was in Dusseldorf um, in Germany. So obviously, uh, having 40 children in Abu Mekalavi uh, next to Cotonou uh, in Benin, it was impossible to bring them to, to Germany to understand what was happening on their continent. And so it gave me the idea to start a space. Um, so in 2005, we started and uh, very quickly, um, uh, it was my first experience. I never tried to create a museum before and it was uh, everyone brought some ideas. And But the first thing I had to face was people telling me, um, actually, African people don't go to museums. That's why there are no contemporary art museums. And I thought maybe it's the opposite. Maybe um, people don't go to contemporary art museum because there are none. So we started uh, trying to understand how people would come to us and um, we opened our door and very quickly we realized that people were not coming um, because they didn't understand what we were there for. Uh, they would enter, but then they would go out in a minute. And when we asked them why, they would say, because it's empty. You have no office, you have no people. And we would say, okay, look at the walls. Maybe you'll see something. Maybe you'll see the paintings and the sculpture and installations. And, and very quickly we realized that people um, could not really understand who we were because we were not, their parents didn't go to museums and they were not going because there are absolutely no uh, museums in the economic capital. So where people live, we were, we were, we were 10 million at that time and 1.5 million were living in the capital city. But nobody would realize, um, nobody could go to a museum because there were none. So we started, um, the first week some children came, realized that it was quite funny to come to us and see um, masks from Romuel Dazoumé and pictures that would ring a bell because it were pictures taken um, in Benin. And so they started to understand that they could have fun at the museum. So we tried to do little games, Q&A, uh, leaflets, very traditional, um, traditional ways of interesting uh, those children. And very quickly, we had a new idea, which was uh, quite different. It's like, if you are at home, you're not expecting anyone to visit you if you don't know anyone. You have to go and introduce yourself. You have to go and tell who you are and why you would uh, make friends with people. So very quickly, we decided we were meant to go out of the museum. So we started exterior exhibitions, which was not very classical. Um, we decided to show uh, the art in the streets, in the most crowded streets where people would come and try to explain who we were and invite them to come to our museums. So that was the first idea of how do we how do we become an entertaining space and how do we create relationships with our audience and how do we reach out to, to people that would never come to see us? And so it was ob obviously uh, very impactful on children and um, their parents started to come uh, quite quickly. So we decided to make it a fun space. Why would the museum be a, a boring space where you learn, but it's uh, it's very traditional? And we decided to try to change the code. When you came to a Basquiat show, we decided to do a treasure hunt. What noise can you find in a, in a Basquiat painting? And so children would run around all over the exhibition trying to find the noise of the painting and uh, come back and would, would uh, um, earn a a present or a picture of a basket drawing, something like that. So we tried to change the way um, people would look at the institution. And very quickly, uh, people came, people came a lot. Uh, we had 6.5 million visitors in, uh, in the last 15 years. So we were really quickly overcrowded. And we realized that uh, once we, after a few years, after six or seven years, we realized social media would be very impactful for, for, our, um, uh, for our museum because if we had opened our space in Benin, there was still no space for contemporary art in Togo, in Burkina Faso, in, uh, at the time in Ghana, there was no space. So we had to, to work on that and we thought maybe social media could 
could give us the opportunity to reach out to other uh, African um, countries and to more people on the continent that would probably be very interested, but the states didn't understand that the funding of culture was absolutely essential in developing countries, as in other countries, and um, private people uh, would still be a little careful about creating spaces. So we decided that social media would be a way to entertain people, which was kind of um, an ex a complicated exercise at the beginning because we were facing entertaining brands who had a lot of money and uh, a lot of communication budgets. So we had to try to find new ways to interest people with local content and uh, cultural content. And it worked quite well. Uh, we have a lot of people coming on our Facebook and on our Twitter and our Instagram. So we decided to reach out differently to, to people and make like WhatsApp was kind of, uh, of one of the best way to, to speak with people. So we tried to, we tried to use brands, companies, um, ideas on the museum to make it, uh, to make people uh, understand who we were and why we were there. And so after a few years, we started singing it again. Um, in 2006, we were given the opportunity to show um, works from the Museum of the Quai Branly in France, which were actually uh, Beninese objects, but who had been taken during colonization. And working on this exhibition, we realized that the kings in Dahomey, the name of the former kingdom uh, that is Benin today, the kings of Dahomey had a something called annual customs. Annual customs was the big, um, the big uh, event of the kingdom where all the population would go to the capital, Abomey, and uh, would celebrate for a few days around the king and uh, all the court. And so we realized that one of the most important thing at that time was uh, discovering the royal collections. The king would put all the population in the courtyards of the palace and get all the most important uh, artworks from the palace, um, walking on women's head, on Amazon's uh, head, uh, around the population and showing the arts to everyone. And so we realized that even though uh, we didn't have invent the museum in the 18th century, in the 18th and 19th century, we had, um, we had a tradition of public demonstration of collections. And so today uh, we are facing the fact that Occidental uh, museums have a model as it has been uh, shown everywhere, proved everywhere. And But we are thinking about the future and uh, thinking of how could we bring something else? What is our future? Where are we going? And how do we impact the people as that live around us? And so, <clears throat> that was one of the, of the most important questions that we asked ourselves after having discovered this tradition of uh, showing art publicly. Um, can we get inspired uh, by our tradition and redefine the Occidental Museum uh, models that we've been using uh, for years? And today is a very important moment because uh, the question of restitution is, uh, is on the table. Uh, will European uh, countries uh, restitute the artifacts that have been stolen during colonization um, to Africa? Uh, today, France has decided to start the move and Germany is thinking about it too. And so I think that today our role uh, as a museum is to probably um, stop thinking only uh, North giving humanitarian help to the South, but more like how do we create a dialogue? Um, we see children who are eight years old uh, in Benin, and we have children of eight years old in Germany. Those children don't have to be impacted by, our, by the worst parts of our common history. They don't have to be uh, only impacted by slavery and colonization. We have a real question today about how do we see uh, our future together? How do we cooperate? And how can we imagine that we don't feel condemned by our common history? But how do we, how do we imagine how museums uh, can help us define a new relationship? And probably, the question of entertainment in museum will be key because children 
of both continents who will be interested in uh, in those museums, who will feel free, will feel in the discussion, uh, probably those children can invent tomorrow's relationships. So I feel, yeah, I feel really happy to share about, uh, about all those things with you in the deep dive in a few minutes. Good afternoon. I'm Pili, the senior curator of M Plus, a visual culture museum in Hong Kong, which will open soon. It's my great honor today to present in Martin Ruth's symposium. I'm very happy to talk about this exciting topic about the museum futures, except especially the topic in our session, museum and entertainment. When we talk about the museum and entertainment, it's in the background that the museum are facing a series of the challenges since the middle of the 20th century. If I may, root, uh, I, if I may, can crystallize or simplify these challenges, I would say there are four major challenges. The first challenge is about the whole structure of our no knowledge has been changed. I, I mean, just like uh, we are not only believe there are one single no knowledge to understand the world. There are not this only single narrative of the his history. There are many new no knowledge and the, and the new, the change of the daily life, the change of the our culture production also changes the structure of our no knowledge. The second challenge is the whole understanding the concept of the history. I think as many people say, it's the end of the art history, which means there are not only a single narrative of the history. There are many histories related to the region, different identity and the different cultures. The third change is that the production model of the intellectual has been changed. I mean, besides of the school, besides of the museum, there are many new platforms can also produce the, 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 no, the no knowledge. And the fourth challenge is the whole concept, political concept of, of new liberalism in the middle of the, since the middle of the 1990s. I have to say this kind of the change of the change, the structure of the no knowledge and the change of the art history or the, the ending of the art, the art history really invoke a more open concept of the museum. It remind us the traditional elite concept of the museum, of the art history, of the history museum are no longer valid. We have to develop a new museum culture, a new field for museum to match or to, to really look in, in, into the change of knowledge since the 20th century. For M plus, as our vision, we are a visual culture museum, focus on those visual culture products since the 20th century till now. So we, when we use the visual culture to replace the traditional idea of the visual art, that already shows we want to have a more open concept for the culture and the history study. Within this concept, we are not only focused on the traditional visual arts, we are also focused on the architecture, design, moving image, as well as the popular culture. And this really, make us have the opportunity to really to put the, this kind of the popular culture and elite art in the same, same, same room. We can have the more equalism idea perspective to understand the different products of the human civilization and the human culture. 
So this really shows that with, with this kind of the first two challenges, the museum really have the open idea to the popular culture, to this, this culture related to the entertainment. I think that's a big step. I'm very proud to be a part of this kind of change. But when we talk about the, there are still other changes which can also challenge the museum. The first is like the production model, intellect, the model of the, uh, the production model of the intellectuals also has been changed. Museum and the school no longer more, no longer monopolize the education and the no knowledge dissemination. And their status is challenged by the virus of the culture and the popular culture in two, two institutions. They are also challenged by the popular culture, internet, social media, um, this kind of thing. So, so there are many ways, there are many approach, many platforms can offer us the no knowledge. And this really forced the museum to find a way to be more interesting, to can have the competition with those institutions and the platforms. And on the other hand, I would say the whole political concept, political idea of new liberalism also changed the idea of the museum. The number of the attendance become the key performance index of the museum operation. Museum, well, they have to be charity, but they also have to develop their uh, commercial pro program to give the museum the sustainability. The museum have to develop their uh, marketing pro, pro, pro program as same as those commercial enterprise. Then we can see there are keep expanding museum shops, blockbuster shows, international traveling shows. In the recent museum practice, many exhibitions even need to have a, a, a corner for the audience can make a soft, a soft, soft fee. The museum can also or have some, sometimes invited the museum, uh, invited kind of internet celebrities to promote their show. This also reflects the, the change of the, psycho, uh, the audience psych, psychology um, when they go to the museum. The audience used to enter the museum with an educated mind. But now it has become a lifestyle to show their tastes. So when the museum faced these changes of the new production model for the intellectual, when they face the challenge of the new liberalism, means museum has to develop the way to be competitive with the entertainment, to make more people feel more joyful in the museum. But I want to emphasize the museum is a place to produce the intellectual. It's a place to effect, act, um, interact with our intellectual, not only interact with our, our sensibility. So this make a museum is different from the Disneyland. As we, as we are now emerge from the post COVID-19 with a social distancing as a part of the new normality. Going to an art museum and to see an art object simply physically becomes a privileged experience. Art museum should be more open-minded to leverage their content on digital platform such as internet and the social media to provide an um, accessible, joyful, immersive, inclusive, and uh, pa participatory experience for audience. Yet, we must remember museum is a place with a dignity where it brings us aesthetic and intellectual enjoyment. It is not a carnival to pure stimulate our sense as those booming exhibitions in the new shopping mall. So this is my idea, my concept, my opinion of the museum and the entertainment. And I'm looking forward to engage in the discussion with you all in my deep dive session.
Hello, my name is Rafael de Corville. I'm stepping in now for uh, Moko Schiller, who cannot be here today. Thanks for having us. Back in 2018, we developed a prototype to explore the possibilities of augmented reality as a medium for museums to guide visitors and tell stories about their collections. We tested our app at the Gemälde Galerie in Berlin during the long night of the museums. The app was not really designed as an entertaining experience itself, but it was something new and it was exciting for a lot of visitors. It had a few memorable moments like when we allowed visitors to close the panels of a triptych so they could see the paintings on the back that you can't normally see in the gallery. And I remember one man in particular who played with the app a lot longer than everyone else. He was smiling, he was laughing, he was having a lot of fun, obviously. And since I was there with the team making a documentation video about the project, um, we interviewed this man. And we asked him, okay, well, what, what did you think about the app? You seem to be enjoying it a lot. And, and I really re I remember what he said distinctly because his first words were, oh yeah, 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 it's great. It would, it would be great for kids. It would be great for kids. Like he was enjoying it, but he thought it was for kids. Um, and I might be reaching a little bit here. Maybe he just meant it would be great for kids as well. It would be great for kids too. But I have to say, it's been a recurring theme uh, in our collaboration with museums. And I think it's revealing, um, it's revealing of a general attitude towards playfulness. And by the way, I prefer saying playfulness rather than entertainment, because I feel like there's a lot of negative connotation attached to the word entertainment. Maybe that's the topic of the day. Um, but as far as I know, there's no playfulness industry. So yeah. I think we're good. Um, to me, it felt like this man thought that it was not really okay to have fun in a serious art museum. At least it wasn't okay to have fun in a serious art museum as an adult. And it made me think a lot about our practice as designers and making digital experiences in museums as we tend to do. Um, we tend to have to challenge institutional resistance against anything entertainment. Um, having worked closely with curators for the last three years, I, I think I can understand their fear to some extent. I think it's justified even. Um, curators don't want the fun experience to draw the attention away uh, from the art itself. They want the information to be scientifically accurate and not oversimplified for the sake of dramatization and storytelling. Um, these are legitimate concerns, really. But if the visitors themselves think that a playful mindset doesn't belong in a museum, even when they personally enjoy it, um, we might have a lot more work cut out for us than we thought. And this is why I believe it is essential to involve curators in every step of the creation process and why prototyping, on the other hand, and testing with real visitors is an essential part of our work. And German museums in particular are in the process of reinventing themselves. Their digitalization of the cultural sector has been receiving a lot of political push and backing financially. There's excitement, uh, but there's also fear. Uh, fear that in the process, we might be losing what makes a museum a museum. Um, entertainment, um, incidentally, is probably the number one boogeyman in that story. Technology is a close second, and fortunately, we work with both. So, yeah, I think both these things, entertainment, technology, the fears of entertainment, the fear of technology, they point to a fear of being replaced, uh, of becoming obsolete. And I remember a story uh, from another project where we were having a meeting with uh, some curators at another German museum. And um, one of the leading curators there um, got in. We had one hour with them because they are busy people. And um, when they got in, before anybody said anything, not even, hello, uh, how are you doing? He put his fist on the table and said, we don't like technology in our museum. And that was the first thing that anybody said. And it was quite the cold shower, I have to say. Um, and 
we had to work from there and say, okay, so why don't you like technology? What about technology are you afraid of? And uh, we did an exercise that we often do in this case that comes from uh, human-centered design, and it's called hopes and fears. It's very simple. We ask them, uh, okay, what are your hopes for the project? What do you hope to, uh, to see accomplished there? Uh, what are your fears? And I have to say that entertainment often comes up quite high in the fear column. So, yeah, we went through that exercise. Uh, we tried to understand what they were afraid of, and uh, we showed them some of the ideas that we had. Uh, we also showed them some inspiration from other projects. And um, what was really quite astonishing is that uh, in just that one hour, um, it was like magic, really. I don't think I was even that confident in the method, to be honest, um, until I saw that one hour later, that same curator was just overjoyed and slapping us on the shoulders and saying like, oh yeah, this is amazing. Let's have the characters from the painting running naked around the gallery. And we actually had to calm him down a little bit and say, yeah, maybe that's not such a great idea, but yeah, we like the enthusiasm. So yeah, I think it's really, really important that we work closely with the curators. And I'm here to say that playfulness is not in competition with the mission of the museum, uh, neither is new technology really. Quite the opposite. I think that used carefully and in collaboration with the experts, playful technology can actually augment the museum experience and make it more engaging for audiences of all ages. So yeah, thank you for your attention. I'm really looking forward to the discussion later and uh, I'll see you there. Thank you. So welcome back to participants. Welcome again to this deep dive session. So from wherever you're following us with our sprinter, Marie-Cécile Sinsou, president of the Fondation Sinsou and Manusha Shamsrizi, co-founder of Game Lab Berlin at the Hermann von Helmholtz Zentrum für Kulturtechnik at the Humboldt University of Berlin. My name is Fabian and I will be your host for this deep dive as well. We are very happy that Marie and Manusha are with us. I would just like to explain how you can participate in this deep dive, so how you can ask your questions, because this is the audience space to ask their questions. If you have a question, there are three ways to include them in this discussion. The first one is via direct audio in this webinar. Please click on the raise your hand icon, which you can find in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. As soon as it is your turn, I will call you by name and enable your audio. Please unmute yourself so that you can ask your question. And as soon as you have asked it, we will turn it off again. So your video won't be used. No worries about that. If you prefer, you can also ask your question in the chat of this webinar, or you use our online form at campus.re-publica.com, campus.re-publica.com, and we will include those questions as well. I would say, let's begin. Manusher, I would ask you for your statement on Marie's sprint. Well, thank you, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, once again, trying to make this provocative, uh, as this is uh, our aim to have uh, the dialogue uh, turned into a discussion. But before I do so, I want to say that uh, I was very moved by uh, what Marie said, and I believe uh, there was one statement, one mindset uh, behind the project we have just heard about that really um, has the um, potential to turn around the whole debate. I know that's big words, but I'm trying to give substance to them. Instead of asking why, uh, what, what entertainment can, can, can do and uh, what the risks are and so on, turning the question around as Marie did and asking why would a museum be a boring space in the first place? Um, that is very powerful, um, and I believe it's the way to go because you would not be able, I would argue, to come up with uh, a very uh, fundamental uh, and substantial reason um, to uh, argue that museums 
uh, need to be a boring place. So that is exactly, I believe, the mindset um, uh, we need. I was uh, also uh, impressed by um, the not not mm, not very easy uh, uh, scalable idea of connecting the work of a museum uh, in such a setting and elsewhere with the uh, rituals and traditions uh, of the society the museum is is part of and of the community the museum is part of, like that um, annual customs uh, uh, event Marie told us about. That of course there are risks, but the um, potential and, and, and the opportunities for a museum and its outreach and its democratization uh, uh, of, of who joins, who who will become, to, to speak in Marie's terms, uh, the new friends uh, uh, that then will uh, join you at home or to say so in the museum, uh, outweighed by, 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 by much uh, the risks of uh, cultural uh, issues uh, when working uh, in this way with your community. So I believe uh, that is a very clever approach and it's a very uh, a valuable uh, uh, approach, uh, keeping in mind that there are uh, uh, risks like, uh, for example, um, the, the, the royal aspect uh, uh, of uh, such an event that uh, most probably would need to be uh, discussed in this historical uh, circumstances uh, as well. And finally, um, uh, another very valuable input uh, we heard from Marie, I, I believe, was the turnaround of the uh, dialogue of uh, North and South. That is something that uh, we, to say so, in the uh, world of uh, tech innovation and, 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 and of digital transformation, um, partly have discussed a lot over the last year, because it turns out that uh, many, many innovations uh, do not happen in the um, to say so, conservative, uh, well-saturated uh, world of, for example, Western uh, Europe, but uh, uh, issues like uh, mobile payment have been developed elsewhere and then re-imported um, to, to Western Europe. So th there are no reasons uh, uh, to, that this uh, should not also apply to uh, modern, um, democratic, uh, inclusive uh, uh, outreach models uh, uh, of running a museum in the collection. Um, so that change of uh, the relationship of North uh, and South uh, uh, is, uh, is of high value. And again, trying to uh, provocate, but but I was too impressed to do so. Uh, and, and I can only suggest that we all stick with the question, why would the museum be a boring space in the first place uh, instead of only asking uh, uh, why it should be a fun place. Well, thank you very much for that uh, already interesting insight. Um, I would like to take the first question that came in through our online tool at campus.republica.com. Um, and Harald is asking whether you integrated the ancient tradition of annual customs of the kings of Benin to your work at the museum, where the treasures of the court were put at public display or adapted in some way. So how are your experiences with this? I'm sorry, because I just heard the beginning of the question and um, I don't see it written. So you told me, how did I import the... Um, no problem, the I can repeat it. Don't worry. Yeah, um, thank you. Did you integrate the ancient tradition of annual customs of the kings of Benin to your work at the museum where the treasures of the court were put on public display or adapted in some way? So how were your experiences with that? Well, so as we discovered this, um, those uh, annual customs, um, well, the most important part of it, I didn't really have time to speak about it, was human sacrifice. So obviously we did not uh, use the annual custom tradition exactly as it was, but we used the idea of uh, the works of art going to see the people and not the people going to, to the museum to see. So we did a lot of um, exterior exhibition, like thinking, where do people go on weekends? They go to the football stadium. So we moved our exhibitions during the weekend at the football stadium. 
Where do you go um, after work in Cotonou, who is just next, which is next to the sea? You go to the beach. So we moved some photo exhibition at the beach. So we tried to use this um, this tradition of going to the works, going to see the people. We tried to modernize it, but we didn't do the full annual custom uh, program, which is uh, kind of more difficult to to put in place in the 21st century. And Marie is asking, um, what, because um, what should future generations learn, as you use the term of um, not, uh, excuse me, where is it? Uh, where, what should future generations learn to develop a narratives for a common history, as you mentioned the term of a generation being very much, um, how is it? Very much framed by uh, the post-colonial discourses, or especially by colonialism? Well, this is probably one of the most important questions that we are facing um, in Benin today. How do you, how do you um, uh, get out of this uh, post-colonial uh, relationship with, uh, with the rest of the world? And I think the first thing you need is really to understand your own history. And that is probably our major problem today. Today, we don't have access to our history and to our culture. Having very few museums that are expensive, that are um, not in the capital city where people live, but uh, everywhere in the country where there are very, very few inhabitants. How do you connect to the people? How do the people connect to their history? And how do you how do you know your culture? Because I think the the reason why you, why you you live with your colonial with a colonial memory is that you only know that because it's written everywhere. The colonial history is written in every French book. It's in everybody's eyes. Even today, European people look at us with the idea of the colonization. If you don't know your history, you're not very strong and you must admit the, the other's history. So that's that's what we're thinking all the time about. And that's why we've done some historical uh, exhibition. We've worked with the Museum of the Quai Branly and we've had the um, Benin's uh, collection coming to Benin um, 12 years ago. And we did exhibitions with private collectors about our history, our heritage. And we've been working a lot on the heritage questions, even though we are a contemporary art museum, but we've still been working on, um, on the heritage questions because I feel children must understand where they come from to understand where they're going. And Manoush, in your experience, because you was working as a as a researcher, sort of, can you is that something that is relevant for you as well on how to develop new narratives? Because I know that you're do that doing that in, in the gamification and by telling uh, or in developing storylines for imaginative futures. So maybe you can. Mm. Well, to, to, to pick up on that, no, I cannot answer that, but but I can uh, paraphrase uh, the question. That that's all I'm afraid. But um, to, to to build up on on what uh, Marie said, I believe uh, gaming uh, is in a similar situation to uh, contemporary art, uh, maybe because of course there are discussions on on narratives, and uh, we should not be fooled. All of uh, cultural mediums uh, that are out there transport narratives uh, and there are competitions of narratives uh, going on and, and that doesn't go away by not watching. Uh, so uh, if contemporary art collections uh, do not uh, uh, search for their own position in regards to narratives uh, 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 that uh, uh, we need to tell or understand uh, on how society relates to its history uh, and if game developers or the gaming ecosystem doesn't do so that doesn't mean that there aren't narratives that are transported so uh, i think it's very valuable to um and, and also necessary uh, to to to, to uh, have that perspective of what narrative is transported what narrative is used because there's always a narrative in any cultural technique including contemporary art that might not have the issues of an ethnographical uh, collection or including games that might think that they are not uh, uh, that in, in, in that problematic uh, sphere of uh, transporting uh, a narrative. 
And um, uh, uh, to, to finish, um, I believe what, what would be really valuable, and we see that in, in this, uh, this Martin Roth Symposium al already, and, and I would love to see more of that, um, uh, would be to, to really have a, a transdisciplinary and, 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 and transmedial, uh, uh, transmedia perspective on this, because um, maybe the museums and the contemporary art collections and games and, and, and book publishers and Disney, which we have uh, heard from uh, earlier today, um, these are all different mediums, but, but they face the same challenges. Uh, they are now much more political uh, uh, than they used to be. They should have been political before, but, but now they are finally um, to some degree. And, and we might be able to learn from each other uh, because the the challenges uh, might be similar, I would I would from what I heard from from Marie earlier and now in her Q and A, uh, I would totally believe that games are facing similar challenges as cultural techniques uh, 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 than um, uh, uh, contemporary art collections uh, uh, face, uh, and we might learn from each other how to handle uh, that, and then the, the to say so ancient ethnographical collections. Uh, uh, find their own way, and, and then we can talk uh, with, with them as well. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see the similarities of uh, of uh, new progressive uh, art forms um, in, in, in relation to these challenges. I have one more question through our online tool. Andrea is asking, apparently technology is the future for the cultural sector. The main challenge is accessibility and participation for a broader audience. How can we succeed to not leave people behind? For example, older people, how do we tackle the challenge in your museum? Sorry, is the question is for me or <laughs> I didn't? Yeah, this question is for you. Sorry. Well, it's um, one of the challenge we're facing too in Benin because it's, um, even though, uh, the mobile phone is almost everywhere and people are more connected on social media and we have we have a lot of issues with people not only older people we have the questions of um, uh, people not speaking the same language we have uh, 80 68 different language in the country so how do you connect to people who are who speak um, a north language or a south language but don't speak french which is the national language but not everybody speaks uh, speaks French. How do we connect with very young children? How do we connect with people who live in the countryside, um, quite far away from the city? We have all those questions and we answer not only by uh, by technology, we answer with a bus going to pick up the children and uh, going to the schools and meeting with the schools. We do a lot of, uh, of work around schools. We, we do um, various uh, languages program. We have a, an app with uh, 17 uh, different um, uh, language from our region. So we, we always face the question of how do we get to people and how do we, do we meet with uh, people who might be excluded? That's the work we do most in the foundation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I see no more questions at this point, so I would let this deep dive end right now. Manu Sher is still with us for the next deep dive. Thank you very much for your time and also for your very, very interesting sprint, I think. And the next deep dive will be with Pili. Um, it will be the last deep dive for today. And I hope to see you there in about one minute. <laughs>
You can either use direct audio of this webinar by clicking raise your hand. You can ask the question and writing in the chat of this webinar, or you use our online form at campus.re-publica.com, and we can include those questions as well. I would ask Manu Chair for his short statement on PD's sprint. Well, thank you, and once again, thanks for having me. I, I have understood the message uh, uh, on uh, short. I'm trying to do so, uh, and once again, trying to be provocative enough that we can have a discussion uh, after uh, 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 these uh, comments. Um, let me start by saying that uh, uh, also in, in this input, uh, which we've uh, heard, uh, many things have been uh, quite impressive. For example, um, uh, uh, Dr. Pease uh, pointing out uh, that culture uh, is a much broader term uh, than art and, and, and that there are implications of this understanding uh, for organizations like uh, museums, which then would need to include this uh, 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 stakeholders of the cultural context of a museum and not only the uh, art world to say so, which might have been the traditional uh, a partners and in, 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 in stakeholders. Um, and uh, we also see with uh, M plus uh, how that can look like. Uh, the, I, was, uh, uh, I was very interested in, in what we learned about uh, uh, virtual and, and online um, uh, events happening even years before the uh, real opening uh, uh, of the uh, museum itself. That's something I'm not going uh, to get uh, too much into that, but uh, there are museums in Berlin which uh, could uh, benefit uh, from that approach, uh, I would argue. And um, uh, also the connection of uh, museums and universities and that uh, knowledge production takes place uh, elsewhere as well and needs to be included. Um, that is uh, all of, of, of high relevance. Um, I also liked, uh, because that uh, connects very much to many discussions in, in this world, um, the uh, Dr. Peace uh, pointing out of um, uh, uh, the new normality uh, uh, not uh, uh, letting us uh, lead into uh, a world in which uh, only, privilege, only privilege decides about who can uh, enjoy and, and learn and intellectually interact uh, with the museum and its partners. Uh, but that internet and digital tools, we know that in the world of gaming is cultural technique as well, uh, can help to, to get rid of that privilege. Uh, 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 of course, there are new problems. Um, but I was uh, irritated uh, to be open about that as well uh, uh, when we heard about uh, the challenges that arise uh, from uh, for uh, museums uh, and, and uh, uh, based on the uh, political concept of uh, neoliberalism um, and, and that the distinction between museums and, and uh, Disneyland uh, also lies in the way how museums react on that uh, uh, issues. Now that my background originally is in political philosophy, I have to come uh, uh, to um, I have to make this point. I, I would have uh, I would be very much interested uh, to learn how a museum that's going to open up in 2021 20, uh, and that builds around this deep understanding of how neoliberalism as a political philosophy uh, impacts uh, the role of a museum uh, can has a place in uh, today's Hong Kong because obviously uh, there must be um, challenges uh, uh, if uh, a museum uh, tries to implement that uh, idea of neoliberalism or any kind of liberalism uh, in a situation uh, where liberalism, uh, so to say, is on the other end of the continuum of what we see in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and it will be very interesting for all of us to see how uh, a museum can stand up to this high uh, uh, and very uh, uh, amazing uh, values uh, uh, and, and functions, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Lee P described. Um, yeah, that uh, should be my first comments on this. Uh, thank you very much for those comments. It would be great to get an answer on your question on how you actually established the museum in Hong Kong. Yes, um, thank you very, very much for the quest question. 
I, I think uh, I want to use a very old quote. I think a museum is still a safe place for the non-safe idea. So that's like uh, many people talking about this whole idea. I don't say uh, M plus so far, uh, when the, the idea of building the M, M, M plus was the 1997 at the very beginning. So by that time, people have a fantasy or imagination that uh, when Hong Kong was handed over to main, main, mainland. The cultural identity will also be handed over to China. But as a place being separate from mainland China for all, almost more than one, 100 years, by their hand, handing back, they're not being, the, the cultural identity will not naturally be returned back. There must, must be some something new. So this is the basic we want to build the M plus. And also we have this like huge collection of Chinese contemporary art from 1972 to 2012. The main reason for the Swiss stock collector Uli Zik want to donate the collection to, to, to Hong Kong um, is that um, well, on one hand, the, the collection can stay within China, but on the other hand, the collection has a proper, will be preserved and exhibited in a proper museum environment with no limitation. Because in most of China, maybe many of the work cannot be shown to the public, but in Hong Kong, we do can. To answer your question, when we, we all know the per, 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 the protest since the 2014 and the most recent protest. That's also a big challenge for a newly built museum in Hong Kong. But for us, like we still believe museum is a mutual place. Museum is a plat platform in which people, uh, on which people can really communicate their idea. So for us, it's very important that we maintain museum as a platform and we maintain museum as the way to discuss the issue. Even in the last two or three months, the both side of the protest, I mean the protest, the pro pro China and uh, and and the, the the protest part, they also have this kind of communication through our digital platforms. So still an, another program for the, the the hackathon in which we invite people to to play with our collection. But for us, it's like we don't withdraw, we don't do self censorship, we don't. Uh, and so far, the 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 critical freedom and the freedom of expression are being guaranteed in the Bay basic law and the 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 the. the the chapter of the West Kowloon Culture District, where, where, which we are beyond now. But for us, it's very important to be an open mutual platform in this era. And the other thing is very important that uh, um, the museum should be open, should, should be a safe place for people to talk about uh, unsafe ideas. Yeah. We have one question coming in through our chat, and that is, what is the right by, by uh, Giovanna? who is asking what is the right balance between digital and analog elements in a museum experience or exhibition in your, exhibition in your view? Ideally, should there always be a combination of both to be totally inclusive to both young and old, digital natives and committed techno folks? Yeah, I, 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 think, um, I think the first, first thing like we just said, the M plus, will, will, even before we open the museum, the museum will open for next year. And even in the last five years, we have a massive, very aggressive strategy on our digital platform. For us, like a first, first of all, digital platform is not on the mirror for the museum pro, pro, program. Digital platform should be a, platform can generate the opinion, the ideas, the understanding, also can generate the, the com community, the virtual com com community for the future museum. So we we, we aggressively, we very um, aggressively develop our media online show, which they're not just, just like a, another show online, but we, we try to do some 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 show only can be on, 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 online and that cannot be be repeated in the physical space. That's the one thing. And by the museum open, we have many. Uh, we have many about. Uh, we have many uh, about. Uh, we have many um, program. Now our whole building facade is a LED facade, which we can commission a lot of 
digital programs. We have the media tag in which people can view in this kind of horror, our collection of the moving image, not those artistic film and the documentary, but also the computer game, like a three, uh, like mm -hmm. a, this is all the new tech, techno, technologies. But to answer your question, how we balance the young and old, I just give you like, a, we, we on, on one hand, we got a very aggressive, uh, very good, um, digital guide tour, but in the meantime, we also can all offer people the very traditional, the audio guide. So that's also the way we offer the all kinds of means for people can make their uh, sele selection. Also, if I may uh, add to that, uh, I think one very important point we heard earlier is uh, museums and, its, uh, and their moral obligation to make sure that there are the least amount possible of privileges uh, when it comes to, to access to this museum. And uh, uh, of course, digital tools uh, and technology uh, uh, can uh, help a lot to lower privileges. Uh, uh, and so the, the balance should not only be between uh, uh, technophobes, I, I would not even understand that, that word, because as Dr. P said, someone who is using an audio guide, uh, would a technophobe not do that? Because the technology uh, as well in the end, um, but, but should uh, uh, be between uh, uh, how do I make sure that uh, people uh, uh, can access museums as much as possible and not everybody to, to point that out uh, is able physically, resource wise, uh, politically whatsoever to physically get to a museum. Uh, we should keep that in mind. And, and, and that is something we heard earlier a lot. And that's something I found very interesting about M plus uh, uh, that this, this, this notion of getting rid of privileges by all everything technology and digital transformation offers. Uh, that's, that's the obligation of a museum of the future, I would argue. Yes. So I have one more question and coming through our online tool, which I would like to include before we come to an end of this discussion. Uh, which refers to something that we heard by Tim Reef, who said he's working on making a museum more TikTokable. So, how do you deal with making your museum more TikTokable? Well, TikTokable. Yeah. I think <laughs> TikTokable is quite a sensitive issue now that we are that they are forced to sell to the American enterprise and it become quite a political issue now, but uh, I think the TikTokable is very important tour for me museum to promote that. Just give you one back background. We have like two major social media, which are besides of the Facebook and the Instagram, which are totally, they are not allowed in, 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 in China. One, one, one platform is called WeChat. That's like a major, like it kind of, it's, it's kind of the communication tour, but also with the, the with the, with many small program can can work on that. And the TikTok is also the totally like the some tour for the young and the new generation. That like you have like a twenty seconds or thirty seconds to promoting that that. So that's also the way for us to to promote our pro, pro program to more, pro, promote our show. But as far as we, are, we also know that each media or each the black, the digital platform has their uh, shortage, ha, ha, has their uh, limit, limitation. So that's very important for us to be aware that not, not only worship to the most uh, newer, uh, most the, the newest the, 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 pla the platform. So, I would let this deep dive come to an end. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. EP. Yeah. Also, we, I think we all look forward to the opening of M Plus next year. Yeah. And also a huge digital applause to Manusher Shamsrizi, the first responder who was with us the whole day, more or less. And the MARS program will continue on the streams and on our website, on YouTube, with the Future Forward panel. I think a great lookout to museum's futures by upcoming museum makers. Raphael de Courville will be there that you already saw in his sprint. And Annalisa Scherfose will be his discussion partner. I hope you have fun with the last panel. And thank you too again for participating in this deep dive and for taking the time to answer the question. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Future Forward session in its third edition. My name is Sarah Berg, and I am saying hello tonight, this evening, to forward thinking professional Raphael de Courville and student responder and outside eye, Annalena Scherfose. So, we'll be ending this day talking a bit uh, more about museum and entertainment. And um, yeah, I Yes, it's a little strange, let me say, uh, that entertainment has been put in focus. As we all know that easiness, relaxation of the mind, and yes, to cut it short, laughter, are just human and therefore self-evident and natural. Smiling eyes, for example, are recognized everywhere. And all of us who've been traveling in far places where we maybe could not speak the language. There we probably used our smiles and friendly eye expression to get in touch, didn't we? So we are discussing all two human needs, is it? So Raphael de Courville, you are a designer whose work merges interaction design, digital art and new technologies. You're also active as an educator and media artist. Since 2012, you have been co-organizing Creative Code Berlin, a community that promotes dialogue between art and technology. And you are co-founder of NOI, a Berlin-based design studio focused on beneficial and playful uses of emerging technologies, including virtual and augmented reality. So Raphael, maybe could you say at the beginning or um, to start with, to which of today's sayings or key words you could um, relate the easiest way? Was it like Robin telling us, communicate and enjoy and education and perhaps reaction will follow? Or was it Tim who mentioned or pointed out we are in the experience economy, so our work uh, should also be, and we just heard it in the last deep dive, uh, our work should be emotional, memorable, TikTokable, and also be to, to be put and understand on Instagram. Or was it maybe Marie-Cécile who said, and I think it was beautifully put, we were asking our visitors, what noise can you find in a Basquiat drawing? Could you tell? You, you could, how, how, how much can you relate to each of those sayings? Well, that's a lot. Um, oh, what else? <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would say all of it, but um, yeah, I, we, I, was, I was listening to the talks and I, um, I perceived that there's a, there's a common thread uh, in all of them, which was a certain ambivalence to the notion of entertainment, um, sometimes a defiantly uh, a defiance to the to the common assumption and saying like yes we should be um, also in the experience economy yes we should also what the museum doesn't have to be boring um, and uh, yeah there's um, there's a common a common fear or ambiguity in the relationship between museums and entertainment that as a designer um, I get to perceive or or feel or, or sometimes really gets expressed by the, the kind of people we work with very, very clearly. Um, and that's what I was talking about just earlier. Uh, I think it's, it's really interesting as a designer to work in this very, uh, in the middle of this tension and to, to try to pick apart the, the hopes uh, that sometimes exaggerated hopes put in, in the ability of entertainment to accomplish the, Kind of goals that you have for your museum like um mr peely was talking about uh, oh now you really want to augment the number of visitors as your main key performance indicator which is a, also a word or a, a term that's borrowed from a, a very business environment um and this this sort of desire to emulate businesses uh, but at the same time a fear to become like one or become like a theme park um and that's that's a really that's a really to me that's that's a, the very interesting core of this uh, of this issue is 
how do you bring back all of these hopes and all of these fears into something that that actually is realistic and that addresses the needs of the visitors because ultimately that's what you that what you want to do um, even if your main performance indicator is the number of visitors it correlates quite strongly to how positively the visitors experience your museum and that should be your target really but that's a bit harder to measure obviously mm -hmm. Um, so greetings to you, Annalise Scherf, as well. Hi there, beautiful that you're with us. Uh, Annalise is a, a project manager, writer and curator, living and working in Berlin in Frankfurt. Uh, she's currently finishing her MA in curatorial studies in Stiedelschule and Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, and she's part of the selection committee and curatorial team for the exhibition monitoring as part of the Kassel Documentary Film and Video Festival since 2019. Since 2017 already, she's program manager of the artist mentoring program BPA Berlin Program for Artists. So hello to you, Annalisa. Thank you um, so much for the invitation. Um, I mean, the talks have been um, circling around technologies and techniques. So maybe, and Rafael already, uh, um, um, mention it why do you think that there's such a fear or why do we lose seriosity once techniques get in <laughs> yeah what was interesting to me is um, the example we talked or the examples that have been mentioned in the sprints oftentimes which were considered to be entertainment were actually um, often a tool for education used at the museum and only because it was technology that was in place here there was this fear of it being entertainment and taking away from the educational um, aspect of the museum that was there originally and i think the the reason might be that this technology is considered to be from the entertainment sector and even though it is used for educational purposes there is still yeah this implication to it but yeah i guess that is really just the medium and the the main question is what's transported with it and not um the the canvas that's uh used to draw onto so yeah, I think it really is because it is from from that that sphere of entertainment industry, or it could be. Mm. So maybe um, right away from your disciplines, um, could you just take us like to a museum or an inspiring gallery of your choice and uh, enter it, visit with us, uh, like. If you just imagine, you know, you enter a space, you get into the foyer, there is the admission staff. What do you see from your discipline? What is um, what are aspects and fields of uh, your research? Could you just tell us a little bit and take us to that journey? How do you enter and see and feel and experience um, museum buildings or gallery rooms? If I think of a really utopic museum and following the current discourse of a museum being a democratic place, a space, um, yeah, a polyphonic space, um, it would be, I can't describe it in, in detail, but I will try to keep it like very broad. Um, it would be something that is, it starts with really the architecture. Um, being something accessible. And I think the moment where P. Lee was criticizing exhibitions happening in shopping malls that um, I have also seen a few in Shanghai, I would actually say, of course, it depends on the exhibition. But in general, if you think of the accessibility of such a place, compared to museums that have ginormous entrances where you have to climb quite a lot of stairs to get in open ginormous doors that would be 
yeah, that would be a place where that accessibility is is easier. Mm -hmm. And to go back to the my idea of a museum, it really is about yeah creating a space for interaction, making it possible. That was also an aspect Manushea um, talked about making something personalized, something you can personally relate to. That yeah makes it possible to connect it to your own story in a way. But I think mm -hmm. uh, Rafael can probably also add to that. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's funny that you mentioned the architecture. Yeah, the we, we've been working with several museums that have very um, intense architectural identities. Um, we worked with the Futurium and uh, with the Kulturforum uh, that both have this very strong, um, in one case, like almost original brutalist architecture in the other one, I don't know if it I'm not an architect, I don't know if it qualifies as a neo-brutalist, but it has this very strong black marble, very beautiful, but also quite intimidating um, uh, quality to it. And we were working on a, an installation that was mainly targeted at kids or younger audiences, let's say. And we did a workshop with kids in this space um, before anything was installed there, really. And so it was this big, empty, temple-like space with gigantic, like really high ceilings and black walls. And the kids were getting very quiet and very silent and very shy. And how can you, with your work as a designer, creating an installation, counteract this? Or um, ideally, you want to play with the architecture, but it was, it was quite challenging. And uh, so we had to come up with something extremely colorful and very bold. To, to change the perception of the space. Um, and that's another form of an augmentation as well. Ideally, you'd be involved early on in the process so that you work with the architecture and uh, in collaboration with it. But very often, we don't have this luxury and we come in at a time when there is an existing architecture, either because it's historical or because it's just there. And uh, you came in a bit too late to have any say in the way that the exhibition is designed. Um, especially when it comes to augmented reality, which often is conceived as a way to counteract some failings of uh, the existing exhibition design that cannot be changed um, from some people. At, at least that's part of the conversations that we often have. And um, I thought that something that um, Robin Reardon was saying was really interesting in the way that you know, they conceive, they, they do space making or place making uh, as part of the storytelling. And that's, uh, that sounds amazing, but very often in a museum, we don't have this luxury and we, we can rely on characters. We can rely on storytelling, sound, uh, visuals and words, but we cannot change the space. And that's, uh, that might be a, a crucial difference with, uh, with a the theme park. So, yeah, um, I think there's a lot to learn from from the entertainment industry for sure. If we're not, if we can uh, try not to be afraid of it, uh, of the word itself, and um, sometimes we try to bring it through the back door through some examples and discussions with the curators um, to show them the aspects of it that might be interesting for their purpose. But we have to be very careful about it because it's a it's a hot topic. It's a yeah, it's a it's a, a big red button that's always in the middle of the room. Um, I mean, we, we, we talk so much about the bringing in the audience and uh, talking about those who organize uh, the space. Um, but uh, how about your experience with artists, um, uh, Annalisa? Would, uh, to what, what extent do they um, agree to be presented in an entertaining? way what would you say i think that really depends a lot on the practice there are some artists who already implement augmented reality and um, aspects of gamification in their work and in that context i think it's interesting because it is never a question whether this work is serious or whether that um, tech is taking away from the seriousness of it what really makes the difference if, is um, if you 
add that element to a work that yeah is also from another century and you add that onto it and i think this is exactly where this fear kicks in because that mm -hmm. usually wasn't an element used to transport knowledge and yeah once you change that you're you're you are not the one writing the wall text anymore as to speak it is the person uh, designing the augmented reality experience and of course that is uh, threatening for a museum person <laughs> You know, that's that's a reason why we we tend to work very closely with the with the curators and there's a lot of fact checking happening it's always part of the planning uh, that we we have times so anytime we touch content we need to have a week or a week or two actually to to make sure that there's time for the curators to have a look and check that it's either scientifically accurate or yeah just um, that it respects their vision and one thing that I want to say about this fear of replacing the experience, the direct experience of the artwork, which is present, especially when we talk about augmented reality, because you have a literal screen between you and the artwork sometimes. Um, I, I always like to say that the, the ideal experience is that you have sort of this gesture, like you look at the screen, then you look at the artwork, then you look at the screen, then you look at the artwork again. And that's where you see something you didn't see in the first place. And we had this in several cases with the, with the artworks in, uh, in the Gemende Gallery, um, because that's, um, there, there can be uh, an augmentation that reveals something that you didn't see the first time you looked at the painting, and now you see it like something was painted over, or there is this, this just faintly um, perceptible um, uh, change in the painting that you could see through the X-ray image that we overlay on the painting. And now you see, oh, this painting by Hans Holbein, the younger, had a different kind of way to face out the, 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 the shells were oriented slightly differently. And why did the painter change this? And you can sort of still see it, but you would have never seen it if you didn't have the augmentation to sort of hint at it. Um, and that's that's really something that I saw actually um, from a, a younger visitor at the Gemälde Gallery when we did the test with visitors. Um, and, and that really showed me that this worked was that they did the experience this kid and so that oh yeah there were characters originally in that painting of a city and they were painted over because either they were not original to the painting or maybe uh the tastes changed at some point we don't really know the creators uh the histo art historians don't exactly know why these characters were there and then not and so the kid saw that and was fascinated by it could now see it in the painting and ran to fetch their sisters and like, look, look, I've seen this and pointed not at the screen, but they pointed at the painting to show them, uh, oh, look, there were characters here and here and here. And to me, that's the, that's the metric. It's like, how can you create a new way to look at the paintings that might be closer to the way that the curators themselves look at the painting? Because the curators are not always available to give you this walkthrough. Um, but the technology might be, and they sh it shouldn't be at the center of the experience, but it's an enabler that brings you a little bit closer to the experience you might have uh, being guided by a very knowledgeable and very interesting person through the museum. I find it really interesting because you mentioned that many interactions with the people using uh, the augmented reality you developed. and. I think, and you also mentioned earlier that um, prototyping and testing is essential for your work. And compared to other methods of education, let's call them the classical methods, I feel this is something that is not used that often, that you really in depth watch visitors, how they interact, for example, with the wall text, that you have feedback loops with them and see how they react to the different options they have available. And I think that is really something that makes that experience so special that you're really, that there is this kind of, let's call it control mechanism that um, 
checks how visitors react to it and whether this really works in the way it's intended. Yeah, you can you can do these studies in a qualitative, quantitative way. We tend we haven't done so much quantitative research, though a little bit. Uh, but we we typically try to have a, a feedback form when we do uh, an installation. We did that at the Naturkunde Museum in the the Bird Gallery, um, and yeah, we we really like to do this because it's a great way to see what works and what doesn't. And um, yeah, a lot of uh, feedback that says, "Oh, it would be great for kids," uh, but uh, but yeah, people enjoy it, and um, and that's uh, that's. That's why we try to do it. But yeah, you, you get surprised by the kind of feedback you get. And that's that's when you know that something might be interesting to change. Um, like for example, sometimes you try things that don't work. We tried uh, wayfinding through sound um, and that was an accessibility issue actually. Um, it, it sounded great for us. Uh, you could point, pinpoint the sound in a certain area using binaural audio or spatial audio. Great tech, amazing, immersive, but some people just don't hear very well from one ear and that breaks the thing completely. And in the group that we had testing the app within the museum, I think like half of the people had hearing hearing loss and just couldn't use the wayfinding. So we just added the map again. And that's just, uh, that's just something you can find through testing, no matter how excited you are about a feature, if it doesn't work with real visitors, then you have to lose it. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, by mentioning kids and youngsters, do you actually draw a line between developing uh, tools and materials for youngsters and adults? Or is it what is working for kids is basically good for <laughs> anyone? It's, I think, I, I really think it is. Um, I really wish it was more the case, but we had um, we had this experience with the um, with the Futurium installation, uh, which unfortunately I wasn't physically present to see, but was told to me by some friends uh, who work there that they had an early showing of the lab to some diplomats. I think a group of French diplomats, and uh, you know the serious kind with a suit, and uh, apparently you know walking around like oh interesting and very nice and then they got to our installation with this big bold colorful funnels that you really invite you to shout and uh, you know bend over and shout in this funnel and then some interesting things happen on the wall and yeah apparently these uh, very serious diplomats were just getting really excited and shouting and not paying attention at all to their public image at that point and uh, that was really nice to hear because that means you know, that's not just for kids. Uh, maybe they wouldn't admit it <laughs> publicly that they enjoyed it, but they did. And um, yeah, I think if you, you know, good interaction is good interaction, no matter for whom. And um, we're all still kids inside, hopefully. Uh, so if you design it for the kid and everybody, then, then you're probably going in a good direction design-wise. <laughs> so, um what would you say in three or five keywords uh, how to bring more entertainment and playfulness to our museums what would your golden three advice would be <laughs> wow uh, <laughs> so yeah playfulness in the museum well as we said before, listen to the visitors, listen to the curators, and um, only use just as much technology as is really necessary to achieve the goals that you set for yourself. Um, whether it's the curators wanting to communicate a certain type of information uh, or the visitors having certain desires or expectations vis-a-vis -vis the museum. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a balance to find. Um, I think there's a lot of hopes put in uh, technology, maybe some in playfulness and ent or entertainment. Very often we hear, like, oh, it has to be playful, but not too playful. It has to be fun, but it shouldn't be a game. Um, and so we, we, we walk on eggshells very often, but we also try to be provocative. So yeah, trying to shake people a little bit out of their comfort zone can be useful, um, but not be too confrontational. And uh, 
yeah, try to inject playfulness in the process, I would say is very important. That's something that we tend to, to try to do, um, like having a, having a ceremony in the middle of the forest with some curators from the state museums was a, a memorable moment, I would say, uh, as part of the process. So we did that. And uh, yeah, you have to be playful yourself. You can't just, you know, be very seriously talking about being playful. You have to embody this in the in your method, in your design approach. And that's what we're we always try to do. Um, it's hard to be perceived seriously all the time when you do that, but it's important to to try at every step. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say um, the entertainment is already there. It really just needs a few tools to enhance it, to unleash it. And I think the most important part of that is really to change the perception of the institution itself. And then it just happens naturally. And yeah, men in suits start screaming around. <laughs> so beautiful. Thanks, my big thank you to the two of you. Um, so keep challenging our imagination, please. <laughs> and um, yes, to the audience, to the audience out there, have a cheerful rest of the evening. And uh, I hope that you stay tuned and we'll be seeing tomorrow again. So all the best. Bye bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. Thank you. Auf bye bye. Here in the East Wing of the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, we find one of the most visually striking parts of the exhibition, the wet collections. Previously, this exhibition was unavailable to visitors until the reconstruction to the outer facade of the East Wing, which we see today. And today, it's among the entertaining highlights of the museum and gets spread a lot on social media, talking about museums and entertainment. The project was developed by Swiss architects Diener and Diener, also winning the DAM Prize for Architecture in Germany in 2011. Which leads me to our topic of tomorrow, museums and architecture. Enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for your engagement in the name of the organizing partners. Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, Republika, Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin and Germany's Federal Foreign Office. I see you tomorrow.